Amen. Let's keep this person, the same person you prayed for right now, keep praying for that person. For two months, it's amazing what God does when we invest the time in prayer. Speaking of prayer, we got a great story for you today. Second Chronicles chapter 20. You know, Chronicles is a book that doesn't get read very often because usually in January we start reading the Bible, right? We read Genesis, then we read Exodus, and then we hit Leviticus, and we're like, and then we start to lose steam. Usually we don't make it to Chronicles. And usually when we want to pick up the Bible and read, we go to the New Testament. So Chronicles gets ignored. And there is this jewel of a story hidden in there. Chronicles chapter 20. And I had read this story in the past. Um, I, I have a, a blog post on this from, from years ago. But it wasn't until I was reading to my children a couple of weeks back that I ran across this story from their uh, children's Bible story collection. And I thought, oh, this would make a great sermon for Thanksgiving. So it's been in the back of my mind. I've been toying with it and playing with it. And, and now we get a chance to study it together. Second Chronicles Chapter 20, I hope you have your Bibles open with you. We're going to dive right in. I'm going to go verse by verse. I want you following along with me because let me tell you, as much as I enjoy preaching and talking and just being with all of you, it's really not about me. If I talk with you and I fail to guide you to the Word of God, I have failed you as a spiritual leader. So I'd love for us together to take this journey through the Scriptures. And my biggest desire and the reason why I gave you this is that afterwards, you feel like you can share this story with somebody else who wasn't here. Maybe some of you have family members or grandkids or little ones that come up. You say, look, there's a story from the Bible. I love to tell you. It's fresh on my mind. Let me share this story with you. So I'm giving you all the resources to enable you to share what you learn with others. And before we jump in, let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we open the Bible, we're grateful that this book, Lord, has made it all the way down to our generation today with these amazing stories in it. We know that they're inspired by you. So, Father, as we read, may the same Holy Spirit that inspired the writers speak to our hearts and teach us what you'd have us learn. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Second Chronicles chapter 20 begins with, It happened after this that the people of where? Okay, you found it. Good. Moab, with the people of Ammon and others with them, besides the Ammonites, came to battle against whom? Jehoshaphat. And I promised my wife I would not make any jokes about his brother Jehoshaphat. So we're going to keep moving forward as we read this story. So Jehoshaphat is king, and there's a problem. There's this huge crowd coming up against them. And I have slides. Look at that. So there's a crowd that's coming up against them, and it's a problem. Verse 2 says, Then some came and told Jehoshaphat, saying what? A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Syria, and they are in Hazazon Tamar, which is in En Gedi. You ever feel like you're going about life as usual, you're, you're doing what you're supposed to do, you're not causing anybody problem, and suddenly the phone rings or the co-worker comes or, or a family member comes around and they let you know the equivalent of there's a great multitude coming against you. There you were minding your own business and this problem out of nowhere that's not at all your fault just comes and it's coming towards you and it looks like it's going to destroy you. Maybe it's a diagnosis you get from the doctor. Maybe it's a something you find that just puts the relationship in a strain with your loved one. Maybe it's something that happened with your children. Maybe it's something that's happening at work. The company's being sold or you're transitioning to a new position and you're not sure what's gonna, what you're going to do. Maybe it's an educational thing where you're going from one school to another school. You're changing majors. You're wondering. You don't know what's going to happen. And it feels like there's a crowd coming against you and it's about to destroy you. And you did nothing to deserve this. It's coming out of the blue, out of nowhere, and it's threatening, and it's not looking good. King Jehoshaphat found himself in that situation. There's a big problem. The problem is bigger than what he can handle. It threatens his very life. It threatens his livelihood. It threatens his relationship. It threatens his well-being. It's a problem. It's a huge problem that he has no way of facing. And maybe some of us are there right now. And we had a hard time being thankful this Thanksgiving. 
Because as much as we want to smile at family members, we know that there is a problem. And we don't know how to handle it. And we're worried. And we think, how can we be thankful? And you hadn't heard the goat story yet, so you haven't uh, you know, considered bringing a goat into your house. But you're wondering, you know, what's going to happen? Let's look at what the king did. Verse 3 says, and Jehoshaphat did what? Feared. He was scared. And then he set himself to do what? Seek the Lord. Not only that, he proclaimed the fast throughout all Judah. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord. And from all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. It's amazing in this story. It doesn't tell us how strong Jehoshaphat was. Doesn't tell us how wise he was. Doesn't tell us the size of his army. He doesn't tell us much about him except what he did. He saw a problem. The problem was overwhelming. It was a great problem. And he turns to God. He doesn't turn to God by himself though. He calls everybody to turn to God. And here's my plug for prayer meeting. We should pray on our own. We should pray all the time. We should pray before, you know, as soon as we get up in the morning, thanking God for the night of sleep, even if it wasn't very long. We should pray to God before we get into our car, asking for traveling mercies because it is dangerous out there. We should be praying to God all the time, correct? There's a benefit to that. The Bible talks about that, praying without ceasing. But there is also a benefit to coming together corporately as a family and say there's this huge problem. And it would be great if all of us could pray about this together. There's an example right here. He says, not only were they praying, he called a fast. Are we willing to go through some discomfort in order to come before God? Because sometimes we'll pray when we have time. But you know what I found out? Most of the times, we don't have time. We're busy. Even the ones who are retired are busy. The ones who are in school are busy. The ones that have kids are busy. The ones that have work are busy. The ones that don't have work are busy looking for work. We're all busy. We never have time. And we always think that somehow by doing, we'll be able to accomplish more than we could by praying. Uh, yes, I will pray when I have time. Right now I'm too busy trying to solve my own problems to bring them before God. I'm too busy doing things instead of coming before God and asking Him for help. And I'm not saying you stop doing things. I'm saying as you're doing things, make sure to leave out room for coming before God. Make sure you're able to come before God in prayer. And He calls the people and they come together and they're seeking the Lord. From all the cities, they come together to seek the Lord. The church family comes together to pray on Wednesdays. It's the middle of the week. People are busy. People rush here from work. They get here. They're still wearing their work clothes. That's perfectly fine. As long as you're here. And we come together and we pray. And I believe there are so many things that are happening in this church as a result of us coming together and praying. You know why I know that? Because I'm fully aware of my limitations. I know that I'm not able to do as much as it's happening in this church. And I praise God for the leaders that I have in this church. And I praise God for the church members and the leaders that come together for prayer meeting. Prayer is powerful. And we're going to see that in this story. But there's something special about coming together to God in prayer. And I'm going to read it and then we're going to talk about it. So follow along with me in your Bible. Second Chronicles chapter 20 starting with verse 5 says, Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah in Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. And said what? O Lord, who? God of our fathers. Are you not who? God in heaven. And do you not what? Rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. And in your hand is there not what? Power and might. So that no one is able to withstand you. Are you not our God? who drove out the inhabitants of the land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend, forever? And they dwell in it and have built you a sanctuary in it for your, for your name saying, if, verse 9, if disaster comes upon us, sword, justment, just, uh, judgment, pestilence, or famine, we will stand where? 
before this temple, in your presence, for your name is in this temple, and cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and we will cry out to you in our affliction. We will come together. We will stand. We will cry out to you in our afflic affliction. And you will hear. Not only you will hear, you will save. And now here are the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who you would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt. And they turned from them and did not destroy them. Here they are rewarding us by coming to throw us out of your possession, which you have given to us to inherit. O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have what? No power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what? What to do? But our eyes are upon you. So here's a lesson on how to pray. He is familiar with who God is, right? Our God, the God of our fathers, he's familiar with God's attributes. You are powerful, you are mighty, you're able to do whatever you want. So he knows who God is. He has a relationship with God. Not only that, he's aware of God's promises. You're the one who drove out our enemies. You're the one who gave us this land. He's aware of God's plan for them. You want for us to stay here. These people are going against your will. God, will you come and judge? Because he knows that God is judge. I'm going to take a quick side note here, a quick tour, and we're coming right back to the story. The Bible's understanding of judgment, especially in the Old Testament, is very different than our understanding of judgment today. Usually we think about judgment as something negative. In the Bible, judgment meant deliverance. They're asking God to judge them. Why? For God to come and deliver them from the oppressor, deliver them from the enemy. You see lots of verses in the Bible talking about the system of justice and how it's supposed to defend the widows and the orphan and the immigrant and not supposed to be abusive. So justice here is about God doing what's just, God defending His people. He's calling Him. They're calling on Him for justice. By the way, that's what we look forward to with the second coming. God coming to defend His people who are being oppressed, who are being persecuted, who are being mistreated. So we long for judgment. Because as long as we're with God, the judgment is always against God's enemies. These nations are coming out of their way to attack God's people. These are nations that God said, don't touch them. Leave them alone. And now they're coming and attacking God's nation. So they're coming to God and they're saying, God, we know who you are. We know your promises. We know what you have done. We know what you're capable of. Please deliver us. Please judge us. You're going to notice in the back of your handout, there's a list of Bible promises that I gave you. I have a longer list on my blog. If you go there, pastormarlin.com, and search for Bible promises, it'll pull up that. I'll put a link of it in our Facebook page. It's important for us to be familiar with what the Bible has to say about God. Otherwise, we come to God in prayer, and we're not sure what we can ask for. We're not sure what he's able to do. We're not sure how to address him. But if we look at the Bible, we find out what God is like. We find out his promises that we can claim. We find out his plan for our lives. And we can ask him to bless according to his will. I love verse 12 at the very end of this prayer. Because so often in my life, I find myself there. Saying, for I have no power against this threat. Lord, I'm coming to you because really there's nothing I can do. Isn't that the Christian journey? Us coming to God, asking Him to do for us what we could never do for ourselves? That's what God is there for. It's perfectly fine for you to come to God and say, Lord, I need help. I cannot solve this problem. Not only that, not only do I lack the power, I don't even know what to do. So I'm just going to look at you. <laughs> I'm, I'm turning to you, God. Because I don't know how to solve this problem. I don't have the power and I don't know what to do. And verse 13 says, Now all Judah, with their little ones, their wives, and their children, they did what? It's so hard to do that. 
You know, as a pastor, there's a temptation for me to be busy doing things. And there's always something to do. There's always something to do. There's a temptation that I'll be so busy doing things for God, I never take a moment to stand before God to listen to what He has to say. They came together, they had the prayer, and they waited. The Bible has something to say about waiting upon the Lord, right? But it's just so hard. You know, I, I would come to prayer meeting if I didn't have so much to do. You know, Pastor, by the time I finish work, I'm so tired and exhausted and there's a pile of things to do at home. Well, let me ask you this. The time that you've been spending doing those things, not coming to prayer meeting, has that pile of things to do gone away? Still there, right? Might as well come to prayer meeting then because the pile of things to do is still going to be there. No, we have so much to do in life that as much as we spend time doing it, it'll always be there to be done. So why not put God first? Spend that time with God. Spend some time standing before God. Then go and do your things. The things are always going to be there anyway. And you might just find out that with God's blessing, what you do will go a lot further than if you had gone to that without coming to God. There are many people who feel like they cannot rest on the Sabbath because there's so much to do. There's so much work. There's so many classes I need to study for. There's all these things that need to get done. I, I couldn't possibly take a whole day off. Maybe we need to read the Bible a little bit more and see what God is willing to do for us. Because then we realize, really, this that Jehoshaphat is doing with the people and the, their wives and the children, they're all coming together, learning to stand before God. This is the only tactic that would work against that great multitude that's coming against them. He could have tried to get his army together, to train, to make more weapons, run around trying to hire somebody else to fight for him. It wouldn't have worked. It was this great multitude. The only thing he could do is come before God together and then wait. Stood before the Lord. Sometimes we don't hear from God because we just don't take the time to listen. We talk, 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 and we run off, and then we do, 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 and then we fall asleep. And then we wake up, and we talk some more, and we do some more, and we talk, and we do, and we talk, and we do, and we never listen. Do you ever read the Bible just listening for what God has to say to you? The words of encouragement that he has for you? It's great to read the Bible, but I am... I'm under the influence that, that many of us read it way too fast just to get it done. I would read it slower, but I'm running kind of late, so I just had to read so many chapters for today, and I, and I got to get going as if it was a routine. It's kind of like, you know, people that will, will cross themselves, you know, hoping that that will protect them somehow. So we read the Bible hoping that that will give us an invisible shield of protection as we go through the day, but we have no idea. We didn't listen. It's okay for you to read less. But you read listening to God, standing in God's presence, saying, Lord, speak to me, guide me. You're facing a problem at work, take a moment to pray and say, Lord, what should I say? How should I respond? You know, I realize in my personal life, things have gone so much better so many times when I just kept my mouth shut and listened a little bit more and waited. A little. I have avoided so many troubles and fights just just by standing and listening if we can do that in our relationship with god just let them give us the words let them give us the guidelines and as they're standing before god something happens in the very next verses as, as we continue to read uh, in second chronicles chapter 20 it says then what happened verse 14 then who showed up the spirit of the lord look at that, the holy spirit alive and well in the old testament the spirit of the lord came Upon Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah, Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Mataniah, the Levite, the sons of Asaph in the midst of the assembly. And he said, listen, all you of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and you King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you. Here's the benefit of listening. He could have prayed and rushed off into war, right? But he waited and he listened and listened to what God has to say to him. What does the Lord say to you? Do not be afraid, nor dismayed. Don't faint. Because of this great multitude. For what? The battle? It's not yours. It's God's. 
Imagine this. Having God on your side, willing to fight your battles. And the only reason he doesn't fight your battles more often is that you don't take the time to ask him and wait. You go off fighting on your own. And God's just sitting there going, I could have done that for you. It would have gone a lot better. And a lot of times, we'll come back to him, and he'll give us like the finishing victory when we're exhausted and sick and in bed and wore out. He's like, you could have just come to me from the beginning. You know, Jesus talks about receiving the kingdom of God as a little child. If you ever seen children ch- trying to earn something, they don't. They just ask. That's why it's so hard going with them to Walmart, right? Can I have this? Can I have that? Can I? And just stop asking. You know, but sometimes as adults, we want to earn it. No, I'm not going to ask God until I'm almost dead. Then I'll turn to him. I remember one time when I was younger going with the senior pastor to anoint a lady at the, at the, hosp- at the hospital. Uh, she had just had surgery. She was recovering. And we were there and he said, well, would you mind if we anointed you? And her eyes grew big. He says, no, I'm not that sick. It's like, I didn't say you're dying. I'm just saying, no, but no, no, no. We don't turn to God unless it's the last resort. But King Jehoshaphat turned to God right away. And the message came, this isn't your fight. This is my fight. Don't worry about it. So many of us worry that we're not good enough to be saved. And God says, who said you're supposed to be? I save you. I give you that as a gift. It's about me, not about you. We keep making religion about us. And then we start looking at each other. Oh, you're not as good as that person. You're... It's about God saving us. And everything else we do is a reaction to what God did first. As long as we try to do it on our own, we're bound to fail and to get discouraged. But as the story says here, what's God, the God of the Old Testament, all the mean God, he says, hey, the battle is not yours. It's my battle. Tomorrow, verse 16, go down against them. You're still going to have to go. They will surely come up, the ascent of Ziz. And you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jericho. Man, specific, right? You're going to go there, you're going to turn left, and right there, they're going to be there. Verse 17, you will not need to do what? Fight in this battle. Position yourselves and do what? And what's going to happen? See the salvation of the Lord who is with you. We get scared and we get overwhelmed and we get worried. And it it robs us of worship. It robs us of peace. It robs us of sleep at night. Meanwhile, God's saying, hey, I just want you to show up and watch. Because I want to give you a testimony to share with others. God said, I want to give you something to share with your friends. But you know what the problem is? Don't stop to listen. We're too busy going and fighting and then wondering where God is. We forgot to bring him along. We forgot to ask him. We forgot to listen to him. And God said, I just want you to show up and watch. Let me do something amazing for you. And then you go and share with your friends what I did. You're just going to come and you're going to see the salvation of the Lord who is with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow, go out against them. For what? For the Lord is with you. Ah, man, can you imagine going to war now? Knowing you don't have to fight knowing the Lord is with you, knowing you're just going to witness what God is about to do. Can you imagine starting the new year, facing 2019, knowing the Lord is with you, knowing He's going to fight you, knowing you're about to witness the power of your God that's with you and what He has in store for you. Because He wants to give you a testimony. He wants to fill your lips with praise so that every person you come into contact with will know the God that you worship. Not because you try so hard to be a saint, but because He just blesses you so much, you can't help but fall in love with Him and let Him guide every aspect of your life. And you'll find yourself changing things that you fought and you struggled and you tried and you could never do and suddenly it's just coming naturally. Why? You just fell in love with God. How does that happen? You spend time with Him. You listen to him, and you open your eyes to see the blessings that he has for you. 
So let's continue reading this story. I told you, Second Chronicles, it's going to be one of your favorite stories now. Second Chronicles chapter 20. We come to verse 18 and Jehoshaphat, he does what? Bows his head with face to the ground. And all of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. The next part that comes is worship. After listening to the word of the Lord, after listening to what the prophet had to say, we could be our equivalent after reading the Bible, they begin to worship. Why? Because of the promises. Because of the word of the Lord. It causes them to worship. God hasn't done anything yet, but the promise is there. And they begin to worship. Verse 19 says, Then the Levites, the children of the uh, Kohathites, and the children of the Korahites, it must have been related, with, uh, they stood up to praise the Lord, of, the Lord God of Israel with what? Voices loud and high, just like Bobby was saying here. They didn't just say, no, the prophet speaks, and they bow down and say, Amen. No, they were singing, and it was loud. Why? Because God had just given them an amazing promise. And they were loud, and they were praising and worshiping God with their voices as the praise team led, not because of what God had done, but because of God was, what God was about to do. They praised God today for what God was going to do tomorrow. They didn't say, well, let's just wait and see. Maybe I'm not good enough to deserve God's blessing, so I might not get it. Is that a concern that they have? God promised? God will deliver. We'll start praising Him now. And it's going to be loud. And it's going to be lively. And people are going to know about our God because of our worship. Our worship testifies of our faith in His Word. The worship is not necessarily about what God did, but about what God promises to do. Do we believe He's coming again? Do we believe that He saves us? Do we believe that we're saved by grace? Do we believe that He will bring us through whatever trials ahead of us? Then we can start praising God right now. Because as we praise Him, we find our faith increasing. Every time we come to church, it builds our faith. Why? Because I'm telling myself, I must believe in God because otherwise I would not have gotten up this early on a Saturday morning. I guess I believe in God because I'm going to church, getting the kids ready, chasing them down. They got their dress dirty. Okay, take the dress, put another dress on, comb the hair, you know, get everything ready, get into the car. Let's go to church. Why? I must believe in God and His promises. I wouldn't have gone through all this trouble to make it to church. And every time we come, we may be tired, we may be discouraged, we may have been offended at church, but we show up anyway. Why? Because God still deserves to be worshipped. But my week was tough. It's okay. He has promises about the coming weeks. The enemy was still there. The challenge was still facing them. But God had already promised the victory. So they start praising Him ahead of time. It gets better. The next day, let's see, we're in verse 20. There we go. Right in the right slide. So they rose early in the morning, went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. As they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. And he says what? Believe in the Lord, your God, and you shall be established. Did he say obey? Did he say do lots of these things and then you will be established? He says believe. The idea is if you believe, your actions will show it. So instead of talking about actions, he'd rather talk about the principle, which is to believe. If you believe, the actions should just follow that. That's why Jesus keeps talking about if you believe, you'll be saved. For whosoever believes. It's the same idea. <gasps> really? Salvation through believing in the Old Testament? Yeah. Look at that. Turns out God has the same plan of salvation throughout the Bible. It says believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. Believe or trust, depend on His Word, His prophets, and you shall prosper. Trust the Word of God and things are going to be okay. Trust the God that inspired those words and you're going to be fine. But you have to believe. But it's hard to believe if you haven't exposed yourself to the words of God. How are you going to trust the prophet? You have no idea what the prophet said. 
How are you going to go into the fight unless you took time to stand and to listen to what the prophet said that God was about to deliver you? You're just going to go and watch God give you the victory over the big problem that's coming up against you. You have to invest the time into familiarizing yourself with the promises, with the prophecies, so now you can claim and rely and relax and trust in them. So here we go. Verse 21. And when he had consulted with the people, I think this is right after elders meeting or maybe church board, you know, he appointed those who should do what? Sing to the Lord. Okay, let's get the praise team together. And who should what? Praise the beauty of holiness. Man, this is just an attribute of who God is. It's not something that God did. It's an attribute that God has. We're just going to praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before whom? Before the army. Wait, you're going to put the choir in front of the army? Why would he do that? Why would he put the, ar- the choir in front of the army? Unless he believed what the prophet said, that you're not going to have to fight. You see, when you don't have to fight, it doesn't really matter the order, right? Let the choir start singing. They're already praising God before God has done anything for them. The choir is going ahead of the army because God says, you're not going to have to fight. Notice in this whole story, there's no mention of the size of the army because the size really doesn't matter. It's kind of like the story of Gideon. God says, oh, you have too many people. What do you mean too many people? You're going to think you did it. And that's the only problem, right? Could it be that sometimes we don't experience more victories because we don't praise God enough? If we would just sing a little bit more, and I'm talking about singing in tune, if we would just give God praise and glory before He does something, perhaps we would witness Him doing a lot more in our lives. A lot of times we're thinking, the army is not big enough, and God says, forget the army, you have me. And we're stressing about the army, and we're going to fight, and we lose. And God says, why don't you call on me? You start praising the Lord and moving forward because the battle belongs to the Lord. It's all about the God that we worship. It's not about us. It's about our God. So the army, the the choir, they went before the army singing what? Praise the Lord for what? His mercy endures forever. So this is, this is their, their battle formation. They had the choir going ahead and they're singing, Praise the Lord for His mercy endures forever. The interesting thing here is that the word used for mercy is one that we talked about a lot when we did our uh, series in Ruth. It's that same word for loving kindness. That God has, that the love that God has, the, the Hebrew word there, there being chesed. You know, His love endures forever they're singing about god's love they're praising his holiness as they're going into battle they're praising god as they're going into battle all they have to hold on to is prophecy but second peter 119 in the new american uh, bible the revised edition says moreover we possess the prophetic message that is altogether reliable You will do well to be attentive to it as to a lamp shining in a dark place until day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Peter is saying, until you experience it, believe in the prophecy. The prophecy is more real than what you can see with your eyes. They have the prophecy and they're praising God and they're moving forward. And now we come to verse 22. Because it's amazing what God does. Verse 22 says, when what? When they began to sing and to praise, at that moment, what happened? The Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. The moment they began to sing, God acted and saved and delivered them. The moment they began to sing, God came and deliver them. They start praising God. I mean, this is not new. How many times in the New Testament we hear Jesus telling people, your faith has made you whole. Because of your faith, you are healed. It's 
That's the way that it works. In Mark chapter 9, uh, Jesus says something along the lines of everything is possible to the one who has faith. They believed, they started singing, and God came through and acted in a mighty way. You know, sometimes I show up for a prayer meeting or for church, and I'm feeling kind of discouraged. Things have not been going the way that I wanted them to go. I feel like I didn't express myself quite right, or, or there's somebody I've been working with, but I'm not really seeing any progress, and I'm feeling a little bit down. Or usually I said something that I regret saying. It happens a lot in my life. And I'm like, oh, Lord, and I, I just show up for prayer meeting, you know, and, and here we are, and we start singing. And by the time we're done singing, I'm feeling so much better. Even though I didn't feel like singing when I first walked in. It happens on Sabbath morning sometimes. You know, you kind of show up at church and like, oh, there's all these things coming, these things at work. And you're already worried about Monday. You know, here's the Sabbath. And, and you're just having a hard time worshiping God. But you begin. You begin to sing. You begin to, you know, just experience worship. And it changes something. Because God works. There is something about placing yourself physically in an environment where the Holy Spirit is moving. Because maybe you're struggling, but the person sitting right next to you is a heart, has a heart overflowing with joy for God. And it's contagious. And some days you're the one with your heart overflowing from God. And it fills up the, this person next to you. So it's important to come to church, especially when you don't feel like it. And when you're full of joy, by all means, come and just share and sing and praise God. Because you allow God to move in a mighty way. When you're giving him the glory, you allow him to move. Remember the story of Gideon. God would not give him the victory at first because they would have taken the credit for themselves. He said, less people, less people. Okay, now I can give you the glory because now you, I can give you the victory because now all the glory goes to God. So we're going to finish the story with this. Um, so they, at the moment they began singing, the, they were defeated. Verse 23 for the people of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir and utter, to utterly kill and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, they helped destroy one another. So when Judah came to a place overlooking the wilderness, they looked toward the multitude. And there were what? Dead bodies falling on the earth. How many escaped? They just came to witness what God had done. These people that came out of their way to persecute God's people, completely destroyed. When Jehoshaphat and his people, verse 25, came to take away their spoil, they found among them an abundance of valuables and the dead bodies and precious jewelry, which they stripped off for themselves, even more than they could carry away. And they were how many days? Three days gathering the spoil because there was so much. God took something that was going to destroy them, turned it around, and that same threat made them rich, wealthy, to the point they had to keep coming back. Instead of fighting a war, putting their life, they're just coming back for the spoils, coming back for the gold, coming back for the, all the nice things that got left behind that God brought to them. And on the fourth day, as they assemble in the valley of Barakah, for they, um, for they blessed for there they blessed the Lord. Therefore, the name of that place is called the Valley of Beracha until this day. Then they returned every man of Judah in Jerusalem with Jehoshaphat in front of them to go back to Jerusalem with joy. For the Lord had made them what? God made them rejoice over their enemies. Something along the lines of setting a table before you in the presence of your enemies. Enemies are coming. It's okay. I shouldn't you be worried? I should. How come you're not? Because God's with me. He fights my battles for me. He just needs me to show up. And I'm going to start praising Him already. But He hasn't done anything yet. I know. But I know that He will. Because the word of prophecy is more real than the reality I can see with my eyes. You can trick my eyes. I can see something that didn't really happen. But the word of prophecy, that comes true. Because God promised and the fear, oh, I'm sorry, verse 28, And they came to Jerusalem with stringed instruments and harps and trumpets and the ho uh, to the house of the Lord. And the fear of God was on where? All the kingdoms of those countries, when they heard that the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. 
Then the realm of Jehoshaphat was quiet. For his God gave him what? Rest. God gave them a rest. You know why I can come and take a break on the Sabbath? God gives me this rest. You know what I do with all my problems? Put them in God's hands. Because worrying about it won't solve it. And I worked all week and that didn't solve the problem. So let's just, you know, I come together and I worship. And I find that this does more for me than anything else I could be doing with my time right now. Spending time before God, worshiping God, studying His Word, familiarizing myself with His promises. And by the way, don't forget the list of promises I gave you on the card. There's a lot more. Start your own list. Go on the back pages of your Bible. A lot of Bibles have white pages. Start making a list of your favorite promises. Turn to those when you're struggling. I'm going to put a link to, to more of the, my favorite ones uh, on our Facebook page. But here's the thing. We serve an amazing God. It's just that we forget sometimes. We look at the army, we look at that multitude coming against us, and we forget to come before the Lord and stand in His presence and listen to His Word. If we can just familiarize ourselves with His promises, start claiming those promises and start praising God even before we witness what He's about to do, just praising Him because He promised what He's going to do. He promises to save us. He promises to provide for us. He promises to forgive us our sins. So we can come together and praise Him. And we can be thankful by faith for what He's about to do in our lives. Amen.